July 2014, somewhere in El Paso, Texas, a man named Jeff Francoeur is trapped in a bathroom. The door is tied shut. He can't get out. Let's back up just a little bit. There have been nearly 17,000 batters in the history of Major League Baseball, and about 1 in 10 were thrown into the fire right away, which is to say they were sent to bat 100 times in their first 30 games. I was trying to find the most exciting start a hitter ever had, so I looked up all of them and I sorted them by slugging percentage. I like that stat. It's easy. It's a fancy way of saying bases per at bat. The higher the number, the more you're clobbering the ball. As you'd expect, most of these rookies were not clobbering the ball, because being a rookie is really difficult. Most of them were below average. Okay, so kind of too early for a tangent but I'm guessing you want to see who's at the very bottom of this really sharp cliff. So yes, we can talk about Vic Harris of the 1972 Rangers who slugged 121, which is awful. He started his career 0 for 36 with 11 strikeouts. It's kind of painful to look at, honestly. Why wasn't he benched? What, what kind of cruel manager would keep sending him out there to... Oh, hey, Ted. Stories like that make these rookies all the more impressive, the guys who enter the league and immediately start wrecking shop. If you're slugging like this, you are on fire. There's Joe DiMaggio as a rookie, there's Albert Pujols, there's Willie McCovey, and up there, right at the very top, is my favorite player. Through his first month, Jeff Francoeur was slugging 755. He had achieved the most explosive start in the history of Major League Baseball. We'd never seen anything like it. And then his numbers went down, way down, and they stayed there for more than a decade. This is the story of one of the greatest rookies in baseball history, who became one of the least valuable players of all time. If you know anything about Jeff Francoeur, you knew this was coming. We have to talk about the Sports Illustrated cover. The natural, it says. Can anyone be this good? <sighs> it's a big deal to make it on an SI cover, especially if you're on there by yourself for a story written specifically about you. I counted up 131 hitters who had a cover like that, and they're all here, charted by their career wins above replacement value. Uh, except for Harry Chappas, I'm not counting him. There isn't enough sample size. He only played 72 games in his career, and he only got on the cover because people thought he was short. He was 5'7". That's not even all that short, especially not for a shortstop. I don't know. Baseball's stupid anyway. So the higher you are in this chart, the better. For example, Babe Ruth, Ted Williams, Barry Bonds, way up there. And even if we go all the way down here, we still find some good players. Ron Gant, Benito Santiago, etc. All the way in the corner, we have Tony Canigliaro, whose career was tragically derailed by injury, and we have Clint Hurd who didn't really stick around that long. But you see the very least valuable player on this chart, the one who looks like a tricycle in a balloon race? That's our main man, the natural. Seven years later, Sports Illustrated seemed to recognize their mistake. Look at the guy who's just as far away from the trend line, only in the other direction. That's Mike Trout, who really is incredible. You know what they put on his cover? The Supernatural. I mean, it's not fair. It's not like Jeff Frank ever has to be put on the cover. But at the same time, I understand why they put him there. July 2005, Frank Gore is in double A ball. He's not setting the league on fire or anything, but he's hitting well enough. The next day, he skipped triple A entirely, joined the Atlanta Braves, and took his first major league hit deep for a home run. He hit another a couple days later, and then he sat on the bench a while. You think that might have cooled him off? It didn't. After 30 games in the bigs, Frank Hoare had the 7th highest OPS in the history of rookies. OPS stands for on-base percentage plus slugging percentage. You know what really helps make that number big? Walks. And you know how many walks he drew on that span? Zero. See, this is the trick to finding Jeff Frank Hoare in a stack of numbers. Just look for the one weird little dot that's far away from all the other little dots. Of those 1,400 or so rookies, only 6 went their first 30 games without a single walk. 5 were mediocre to bad, and the other was historically great. It was such a weird thing. On average that season, batters were walking about once every 12 trips to the plate. Jeff made it to plate appearance number 131 before his first walk, and even that was an intentional walk. He was intentionally walked before he was unintentionally walked. If we're only counting walks that he actually had a say in, we have to skip ahead to plate appearance number 139. I honestly thought that was going to be a record. Turns out it's not, thanks to Terry Humphrey, who, in 1971 and 72, didn't earn his first career unintentional walk until plate appearance number 140. Then he walked six of his next 14 trips to the plate. Baseball's so 
weird. This coincidence is also weird. I promise I'm getting back to Jeff Francoeur. It's just going to take me a minute. So, Terry Humphrey was teammates with Tim Foley, who was originally going to play quarterback at USC before the Mets drafted him. He described his career as, quote, life and death, a constant struggle to survive. One night, he literally dragged a sleeping bag on the field and spent the night at his shortstop position. Fast forward to 2001, he's a Cincinnati Reds coach who gets in a clubhouse fight with Ron Oster, another Reds coach. Oster got Foley on the ground, and then Foley, a 50-year-old man, bit him in the leg. Baseball is weird anyway. Foley and Humphrey have something really specific in common. Humphrey was the only rookie worse at walking than Jeff Francoeur, and Tim Foley was the only player in baseball history with as many plate appearances as Jeff Francoeur, who was less offensively valuable than Jeff Francoeur. Let's take a tour. Babe Ruth, Ted Williams, Mickey Mantle, Barry Bonds, Miguel Cabrera, Hunter Pence, Billy Butler, Jeff Francoeur. Once again, all by himself. These wins above replacement stats are so cruel sometimes. I'll explain. Let's compare Francoeur to J.J. Hardy, a very similar hitter. They've been at the plate a similar number of times, both have an OPS of 720, and their slugging and batting average are basically the same. So how does Hardy have 18 offensive wins above replacement and Francoeur only has like one? Well, that's the above replacement part. See, Hardy is a shortstop. Last year, there were only five shortstops in baseball who could do better than that 720 OPS. It's hard to find a shortstop who can hit as well as Hardy. Meanwhile, there were 39 such outfielders. The more people out there who can do what you do, the less valuable you become. And that is why Hardy, the shortstop, is here, and Frank Orr, the outfielder, is here. Frank Orr's production cooled down after the first 30 games because nothing of that nature is sustainable, but a hitter generally gets better in his 20s. Frenchie was getting worse. Halfway through the 2009 season, the Braves did something that a few years prior would have been unthinkable. They traded their hometown guy to their arch rivals. Frank Orr was in shock. You imagine getting traded, he said, but you don't imagine getting traded to your biggest rival. He was right to be in shock because trading was something the Braves and Mets just never did at the major league level. Across a 19-year span from 1996 through 2015, the Jeff Francoeur trade was their only trade with one another. About a month after being traded, Jeff Francoeur suffered what I consider to be the saddest at bat in the history of baseball. Bottom of the ninth, Mets are down three, Angel Pagan leads off and hits it between first and second, he reaches on an error. Luis Castillo is up next, he hits it between first and second and reaches on an error. Daniel Murphy is up, he hits it between first and second and reaches on a ground ball hit. The Mets' luck this inning is unbelievable. Jeff Francoeur steps up. They're down two with two on and none out. Like all three guys before him, he hits it between first and second. The runners go. Wide drive caught by Brooklyn. He makes the tag. It's a triple play. And the ball game is over. An unassisted It's only the 15th unassisted triple play in the history of Major League Baseball, and it hasn't happened since. The game was over, but Jeff just stood there, staring at the ground, the unluckiest hitter on the planet. This was the 195,851st game in the history of Major League Baseball, and it was only the second game to end with an unassisted triple play, putting his odds at nearly 100,000 to 1. He must have been thinking, how did this happen? How did I get here? How did any of this happen? I mean, I don't know. I'm not a hitting coach. I can show you where he liked to swing the bat. He swung a little more than usual over the plate, which seems fine, but look at all the pitches he saw outside the strike zone. He loved to chase up in the zone, he liked to try to golf the ball, and he swung it inside pitches two or three times as often as the average player. My guess is that for the first month of his career, this helped him, and once the other teams got the scouting report on him, it really didn't. Francoeur is now mired in the second worst five-year skid of the last 25 years. The worst belongs to Unieski Betancourt. Man, those 2012 Royals really were special, but there's something I want you to look at. Over the course of baseball history, there have been 44 similarly bad five-year stretches, and a lot of them belong to players who bounce from team to team, but none between as many teams as Frenchie. He was in six different organizations, and while I was researching this, the Marlins traded for him, so let's make it seven. He's now played for almost the entire NL East. I figured that had never happened before, but again, I was wrong because his teammate did it. Kelly Johnson went from the Braves to the Diamondbacks, then to every single team in the AL East, and then he went to the Braves again, who traded him to the Mets. Then he went to the Braves again, who traded him to the Mets again. Anyway, 
Frenchie is interesting because he's not like other players who have been traded a lot. Octavio Dotel was one of the greatest strikeout artists in the history of relief pitching. Kenny Lofton was a good hitter and a great base stealer and should probably be in the Hall of Fame. Matt Stairs evolved into one of the greatest pinch hitters of all time. But Jeff Rancourt doesn't really have a statistical specialty. He's better against lefties, but even then he's below average. He's a good, not great fielder. He's not much of a base stealer. He's certainly a below average hitter. Numbers wise, he's a baseball layperson. No, see, Jeff Rancourt's specialty is that he's an awesome dude and everyone likes him, which is something that's impossible to chart, but I'm still gonna try. So Frenchie's in the outfield in Oakland one day, and fans in the right field stands are heckling him because they always do, and Frenchie starts talking to him. They kind of warm up to each other, and after the game he hangs out with him. The next day he figures they could probably use some beer money, so he gets a ball, autographs it, ties a hundred dollar bill to it, and chucks it their way. A while later he visits them again, they give him some snacks and a t-shirt with his name on it, he repays them the next day with a signed bat and 20 pizzas for the whole section. To these fans his value was enormous. Frank Hoare's relationship with A's fans is unlike anything I've ever heard of, because here's the thing, Jeff Frank Hoare has never played for the A's. He might be the nicest guy in baseball. Teammates love him, managers love to have him on their team. Maybe that's why his career is unkillable. Or maybe it's because they're not looking at the same stats that I am. Or maybe some teams feel like they can bring that 2005 Jeff Francoeur back out of them again. At any rate, he was one of 65 rookie outfielders in 2005. And he's one of only six who have made it to 2016. And despite stats that are far worse than any of the rest of them, he's still here. He's still here. Jeff Rancor has been stuck in this clubhouse bathroom for more than an hour. His teammates have pranked him by tying the door shut. He can't force it open. He tries to bust the entire door down. It's useless. Then, for a few moments, it's quiet. And then his teammates hear a rustling in the ceiling. <laughs> Over in the locker room, a ceiling tile disappears, and Jeff's legs come dangling out. Just when you think Jeff Francoeur is in the toilet, he finds a way. His career is unkillable. He's like an endless void, without any of the mystery. He is my favorite baseball player.